So now let's talk about dynamic discrete choice models kind of more generally and more formally. I hope that example we just went through in the last video helped kind of with, with some of the ideas, but but now we'll, we'll say things kind of more generally. So maybe it's easier to draw some connections with specific uh, research questions you have in mind. So in order to do this kind of dynamic optimization, there are a few different things we need to keep track of as we're thinking about, or, or really that our decision makers are keeping track of, and so that we also need to keep track of. Uh, we need to keep track of this kind of sequence of choices. We're gonna call this I1, I2, all the way up to IT. This is gonna tell us the entire sequence of choices made up to and including period T. We're gonna to need to keep track of that because the utility that a decision maker would get in a certain time period from a certain alternative is going to depend on everything they've done up to that point. Remember, like in our example, the utility of a certain job is going to depend on whether they went to college or not. That might set their salary, for example, and, and so we're going to need to keep track of that. So this is going to tell us that this kind of notation here is telling us the utility that's obtained in period T from alternative J if this is the sequence of choices that have been made up to that point. We also might want to think about not just what is the total utility or, or what is the utility in time period J, but what is going to be the total utility of this time period and all future time periods that are obtained from choosing alternative J in period T, right? In the last video, we talked about how really people aren't thinking about just utility in one period, but the full future stream of utilities. And so that's what this total utility term here is it's saying, what's the total utility a decision maker will get in this and all future periods if in time period T, they choose alternative J after having made this sequence of choices in all future time periods. And this is implicitly assuming that in every future time period, they're going to make the optimal choice. This object I just described is sometimes known as the conditional value or valuation function. And then finally, we also have this object that's just total utility in time period T. That's going to be the total utility obtained from making the optimal choice in time period T and making the uh, uh, optimal choice in all future time periods. So it's just kind of like looking over all of these conditional value functions and choosing the optimal one. Depending on how we kind of write things down, sometimes one or the other, these will make more sense. Uh, and we're going to call this the value or the valuation function at time t. And the reason we, we had to just work through all this notation is that uh, uh, in order to you know, express the optimal choice in each time period, we are going to want to think about and actually calculate all possible values of the total utility from each possible choice in a given time period. We need to calculate this in some sense so that we can think about which of these would be optimal, what is the decision maker actually gonna choose. So the decision maker, we're gonna assume, assuming that they're rational and have perfect information, which we'll, we'll assume that for now, they're gonna choose optimally. In other words, they're gonna maximize utility in the current period, knowing that they will also choose optimally in every future period. They're also gonna discount the future with a discount rate of delta. And that's gonna give us an expression for the value function at time t. The value function at time t is gonna be the maximum of the utilities in time period t plus this discounted future time period uh, total utility of the next time period conditional on the choice made in this time period. This is going to tell us how total utility in one period relates to total utility in the next period, or how total utility in one period relates to total utility in the previous period, depending on how exactly we express this. And this relation between total utility and sequential time periods is known as the Bellman equation. And it's going to factor importantly into how we think about solving dynamic discrete choice problems. Uh, we could instead write down a Bellman equation for the conditional valuation function where we, we, we don't maximize over the first period, depending on what we do, one or the other of these might just work out better for us. But the basic idea is the same. We are uh, uh, thinking about expressing uh, total utility 
in one period versus total utility in the next period. And the reason this is going to be helpful is it's going to allow us to actually base, uh, you know, if we, if we have a finite number of periods, the way we're going to solve this model is to think about starting in the final period and using that Bellman equation to work backwards, work from the last all the way backwards to the first time period, solving utility values in each time period, which then allows us to construct choice probabilities the choice probability for the kind of entire sequence of choices that we have seen. And so the basic idea here is that we start with the last period because in the last period, there are no future periods to think about. So total utility in the final time period just equals utility in the final time period. There's no future to think about anymore. So we can think about expressing utility in the final time period. Of course, it will depend on all of the choices that have been made in all of the t minus one previous time periods. Well, once we know total utility in the final time period, then we can think about calculating total utility in period t minus one. Use it, because now we know what the future looks like. We've already calculated total utility for the last time period. So now we can use the Bellman equation to express what will total utility look like in t minus one. Once we know t minus one, we can think about t minus two. Once we know t minus two, we can think about t minus three and so on. And so essentially what we're doing here is we're calculating the utility in time period t of alternative j conditional on all future choices. We need to do this, uh, sorry, conditional on all past choices. We need to do this for every t, for every j, and for every sequence of past choices, all of the all possible i sequences. And what this means is that if we have j alternatives in each of t time periods, we actually have to calculate j raised to the t, the kind of total number of possible sequence of choices is j raised to the t. We have to calculate that many utilities in every time period. So we have to calculate j raised to the t times t different utilities. That is a lot to keep track of. And that's why this dynamic, the dynamic problems just become so much more computationally difficult and even theoretically difficult. And, and this kind of computational burden is known as the curse of dimensionality. But the basic idea here is that once we have all of these conditional value functions that we described in the past, uh, in, in the previous slide, we can use those to write down choice probabilities. So for example, the probability that a decision maker in period one chooses alternative I, once we've calculated, we've started in the final period and worked all the way back towards pre period one. Now we know total utility in period one for each possible alternative selected in period one. Now we can write down a choice probability for each one of those. We're gonna to have to make an assumption about how our, our epsilons are distributed, right? I didn't even say this, but each one of these utilities is gonna have a, an observable and an unobservable component. So that's gonna add some difficulty here. We're gonna to have to make an assumption about how these epsilons are distributed in every time period. And then we're gonna to have to simulate this choice probability. But I think you could th see in theory, this is something we could do. It just becomes very computationally burdensome to actually do it. Um, I'll uh, point you to the train textbook for more details on how exactly all these pieces fall together. I just wanted to give you a really rough overview here so that when you come across this in a paper or maybe you even uh, have your own problem that's needing dynamics, uh, you kind of have some idea of what's going on either to understand what others have done or to maybe have some idea of what you need to do to start to tackle one of these problems. We didn't even talk about uncertainty. We said, let's assume there's perfect information, but uh, usually there's not, uh, which can be tricky. Um, we put, but so far we've assumed perfect information, meaning that the utility of each alternative in, in each future period, time period is known to the decision maker and how, and they will, and also the decision maker knows how their choice today will affect those future utilities. Uh, but really that's unlikely to be true. Uh, unless we think that these these decision makers, you know, can can see into the future, there's probably going to be some uncertainty in, on the part of the decision maker as well. One thing we can do to simplify this 
or, or, or I guess I should say before we simplify it, let's describe what we would need to do in the in the case of uncertainty. Um, what, what the decision maker would do is to basically think about maximizing total expected utility. Total, to, sorry, maximizing total expected utility. Because there's uncertainty, they need to think about expected utility, not 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 you know utility with certainty. And the way we can get those expectations is by thinking about having a distribution or a density of the unknown factors that are going into their decision-making process. And we need to think about integrating over all of those unknown, you know, those, those, those sources of, of uncertainty to the decision-maker. That's adding another integral to our simulation, kind of yet another layer of complexity and dimensionality to the problem that already suffers from the curse of dimensionality. So, so there's adding uncertainty here gets more difficult. There are a couple of things we can do to simplify though, one on, the, one, on, on, on that aspect and, and on other aspects. Um, one thing that can help with the curse of dimensionality is to just use the fewest number of time periods possible. In that example in the last video, we kind of assumed there were only three time periods, college, job, and then retirement. We could have talked through that annually, thinking every year the decision maker thinks, do I wanna stay in college or do I wanna drop out? And then I choose a job. Do I wanna stay in my job or do I wanna change jobs? But you know, then we'd probably have something like 60 time periods to think about instead of just three. And that adds kind of like an extra order of magnitude, at least to our curse of dimensionality that, you know, even working through that example, it kind of felt like things were already starting to get a little out of hand with even just three time periods. So trying to kind of bundle, bundle things together into, into broad time periods so we can have the fewest number of time periods possible can be good. Um, the other thing we can do is, is uh, uh, make the assumption that the kinds of factors that the decision maker does not observe, so the, the, the sources of uncertainty to the decision maker, are the same things that we, the econometrician, don't observe. And let's assume those are IID extreme value. This assumption is completely unrealistic, but what it buys us is choice probabilities that are gonna have closed form and expressions that are more easy to calculate. And if our trade-off is between making realistic assumptions that get us to a model that's completely intractable and unsolvable versus making unrealistic assumptions that get us to a, a you know, tractable model, um, maybe we're willing to make those assumptions just so we can actually solve something even if they're not fully realistic. Um, so that, that's the trade-off that might exist there. Once again, check out the train textbook for more details on all of this stuff. I'm only just kind of touching the surface, especially these more complicated topics, but I just wanted this to, you know, you, you to have, have just this kind of uh, very brief introduction to dynamics. So you have some idea of what's going on when you see dynamic models or, or maybe want to even start thinking about one yourself. So that's it for dynamics. In the next video, we're gonna start talking about endogeneity.